Panel, 30 second warning. Wonderful job, everybody, of uh, meeting that 30-second uh, mark. Uh, we're going to continue on with this discussion, um, and I want to bring up our next moderator for our uh, following <laughs> panel. Uh, it is Dr. Samantha Kaplan. She's an assistant professor uh, at the Department of OBGYN and diverse, uh, assistant dean for diversity and multicultural affairs at Boston University School of Medicine. Uh, she is... Um, good friend, and she is also a past Commonwealth Fund fellow, also graduating in 2008? Nine, that's right, because you interviewed me. Uh, that's right, uh, and uh, received her MPH from um, Harvard uh, School of Public Health as well. With that, Dr. Kaplan. I'm going to stand to the side just a little bit because I'm so short. Um, so we have heard about systems-based interventions that can um, impact specifically maternal mortality and morbidity uh, in the perinatal period, uh, layered on top of a conversation about statistics and data gathering. Um, and I think one of the things that really stood out for me in Dr. DeClerc's comments um, in looking at some of the causative agents was that big area that was attributed to community. Um, and so what we're going to talk about on this panel is the uh, community-based interventions that can be made and, and ideas, opportunities that exist for us to begin to mitigate some of those disparities beyond the walls that we can control or that we think we can control or we try to control um, as, as clinicians or um, I would say uh, administrators. Um, and I, I think a lot of what we're talking about in the community falls under that umbrella of what can be done in public health. Um, some of public health is programming, some is policy, but some of it is actually directly interacting with the public around health. Uh, and so that's what we're going to hear about from this panel of experts. I am going to let you know we will have time for questions, and at the end we will have commentary on both panels. So I will try and um, keep my thoughts uh, limited, although I have one reflection after listening to the first panel and this panel, uh, which I will share at the end if it doesn't come up. I also um, am not nearly as social a being as Audra, so I have very little personal information to share, but I think we have fantastic panelists from the brief interactions that I've had with them, um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about them. I think the order that our panelists are going to present is also important because it's really going to bring you into um, a greater understanding of how important the community and working with community is. So we're going to start out by hearing from Necka Hall. NECA is a full-spectrum doula. She is the mother of four. She has an 18-year-old, a 13-year-old, a child who would be eight, and a four-year-old. Um, she is a Holman advocate who works with women across a full spectrum of their life and their life phases, um, specifically looking at pregnancy and infant loss um, and maternal mortality within the African-American community. Um, as a full-spectrum doula, she is um, an international bereavement specialist and a community-centered herbalist and a womb health advocate. She is also a part of a number of very important community organizations. She's a member of Vital Village, Boston's Community Action Network, Boston's Breastfeeding Coalition, and This Is My Brave, and she was featured on This Is My Brave um, in January of 2019 within the documentary. She's going to talk to us today from both a personal and professional perspective on the importance of support of women um, to impact perinatal mortality, and not just specifically when we tend to think about it within the period of birth, but in a much broader view in the antenatal and postpartum period and how that can impact uh, mortality for women. One second for technical. Okay, awesome. I um, normally don't like working with these things because I'm not a very tech savvy person, so bear with me um, and we'll get through this. Um, first, paying homage 
to my ancestors who have somehow managed to fill the entire month of May with speaking engagements. Um, however, when I received the email from Ying inviting me to speak here, I thought um, it was a prank from one of my older children or a dear friend, and I'm so happy I didn't press send on the initial response I had written. Um, but more seriously, as a young girl, one of the first words I learned was statistic. I somehow became fixated on it and prayed that I would not grow up to be one. I honestly wished, wished someone would have informed me that because of my color, the color of my skin or my ethnicity, it was my birthright. On August 26, 2010, I was blindside, blindsided by a statistic that I should have known about. At 39 weeks gestational age, my daughter died and my OB comforted me with three words. These things happen. August 27, 2010 was the day my daughter arrived Earthside. It was also my 37th birthday. My year of fog began. August 27, 2011, I looked at my children who were then 11 and 6, looked at their faces as they screamed, sang happy birthday to me and their sister who should have been there to celebrate with us. Uh, they were pleased and I wasn't. I faked a smile and was able to contain the tears until I ran out of the room. But tears are cleansing and for the first time in a year, I was able to see a little bit through that fog. I needed answers, and for the first time, I found the strength to review my medical records. I later found a doctor who was able to decipher the medical jargon because clearly I had no idea about the chicken scratch or terminology, what have you, and discovered that I should not be here. I'm, you're looking at a ghost. I'm a ghost who was reborn on her 37th birthday. I complained about my daughter's actions and my feelings throughout my entire pregnancy. And sadly, because of my history with depression and marital problems, I was sent for a psych consult. Proteinuria was labeled as an unclean catch for an entire trimester. A slightly raised blood pressure was just looked at a normal blood pressure result. And as a result, my daughter passed away. Cause of death asphyxia. Now I can close this and really talk to you. 2011, I became a doula. I thought that I would be able to work with others and sort of bridge the gap between, oh, I can, let me see, um, be, between lay people such as me and moms who look like me. I could um, tell them things, learn the terminology that I could not understand at the time. And mind you, at the time of my loss, I was um, the mom of two already. So I'd already experienced the pleasures, the joys related with um, having live births. And now I can look back at the birth of my, and this is my rainbow baby, my four-year-old. Um, I could look at the um, look at the death of my daughter as being my rebirth, because now I'm able to focus on um, helping others and make sure that they know a little bit more and they're able to use their voices and to be heard, so that they can be heard. I realize as a doula, I'm not allowed to speak for them, but they are allowed to speak for themselves. And I, I just have to credit. The slides that I'm using um, came from one of my sister doulas in Connecticut um, who said, oh, go ahead and take that information. It was just easier to use their jargon rat for, that they're using for their um, doula bill than to recreate my own. Um, so you can see here, what is a doula? Everyone here who has given birth, have you had a doula? Do, does anyone, before this definition, did, did anyone in here not know what a doula was? Yes, no, no, no. Oh, great. This is the first room I've ever been in where everyone knows what a doula is. So doula care. 
increases the likelihood of a shorter labor, a spontaneous vaginal delivery, higher APGAR scores, and a positive childbirth experience. Now, I had never heard of a doula before 2011. And I happened to stumble on the term and had to know more. See, that's my problem. I have to know too much. There are times when my children say to me, come on, mom, just accept it for what it is. And I'm not that type of person. Um, reduces the likelihood of costly interventions, reduces spending on non-beneficial medical procedures, avoidable complications, and preventable chronic conditions. Improves health outcomes for both mothers and babies. We also bridge the gap between community services. So we can go into the community, we, we partner with community um, organizations such as Boston's Community Action Network. Um, Anna and Namisha are here to support from the Community Action Network. Um, I'm proud to say that in our recent, most recent All Can meeting, um, we found out that because of our work since 2011, the infant mortality rate has, rate has dropped by 37%. And currently, um, the CAN is working on a femur bill as well as um, preconception health, um, a variety of preconception health things. Most recently, we're working on interviewing African American and women who identify as black to see how the community re relates to them um, if they feel like they're being judged, if they're being spoken against or what have you. I'm sorry, I gotta get through these slides. Um, patients who have hired a doula reported feeling valued, having had a voice in consequential childbirth decisions. We slow th things down, we translate. We're there for them before they get pregnant during the pregnancies, as well as that first 40 days postpartum. Now, at least I am. I um, had the opportunity to travel to um, New Mexico in December and take the best training in the world, um, Innate Traditions Postpartum Care Training. If any of you have the opportunity to take that training, it is also an online training. I know most of you have spent your lives and most of your money becoming doctors. However, this will put things into a different frame for you as birth and postpartum providers. Um, it was a life-changing experience for me. I hadn't seen the postpartum phase um, so eloquently supported. And it taught people from different um, socioeconomic statuses how to provide support in their communities. Um, one thing that I would like to say in closing, and I'm sorry, there are several organizations um, that you guys should become familiar with. Even within the hospitals that you service, there are doula programs, volunteer doula programs, that your clients, if they don't have the support, should be referred to. I've heard, had clients who could not afford my fees, and I said, well, why are you trying to pay me when there's a volunteer program? Well, what happens is, if you're not coming in on Medicare, they don't refer. They assume you have the money to pay the $1,500, $2,500 fee of the, um, you know, for the doula, when that's not always the case. So look into your systems to see how we are there and who we are. Oh, I have two minutes? Oh, okay. Um, how we are there to support you. Also there, um, we have the Birthing Project USA, which sets up systems of community um, kitchen talks in churches and community centers that can um, be formed just by talking to grandmas. They come in and they provide support from conception through the first year of life. And they come in and they support the families as doulas um, if they cannot afford a doula. We also have Bridging the Chasm, which is a new program that should definitely be looked into. There are several different work groups going on now. Um, and these are people who are from all over the United States who are coming together to figure out why this is happening, why mothers and babies are, t are, are dying. 
Um, in the Boston area, I love the Smart from the Start program. If I have a family who definitely needs the community help, I refer them to Smart from the Start, uh, which has several different locations, and they provide support from conception through age one and also beyond. Um, what they do is they pair them up with someone in their program, and they walk them through their pregnancies. They make sure they make their doctor's appointments, they make sure things are understood in lay language, and this is crucial, especially for people, and this is a program for low-income families. I'm saying the entire family unit, not just mom, because we focus on mom during pregnancies, when it should be in the entire family unit. And if mom is a single parent, they help to provide that excess support by linking them to other community um, supports. And this is my angel baby, Anaya Marie, who would be turning all nine in August. Um, this presentation is in memory of all mothers and babies who have died before birth and in the year that has followed. Thank you. So our next panelist um, is going to talk a little bit about the community from a different perspective. She's an assistant professor at the American Inter International College at the School of Health Sciences in the Public Health Program at Springfield and an adjunct professor at Holyoke Community College. Um, she is currently president of the board of directors and the executive director of Mother Woman. This is Dana Campbell, who also is in the process of pursuing her PhD um, in um, Health Services Policy and Management at the University of South Carolina. It's so very busy um, and is going to talk to us today about community-based participatory programming. So this is what we all learned when we were getting our MPHs is a critical way to make sure that what you're doing is not to the community or for the community but with the community, and perhaps you even invite the community to be involved in the programming themselves. What wasn't mentioned, um, in my spare time, I'm raising a six-year-old daughter. <laughs> <laughs> so again, um, my name is Dana Campbell, and um, and so I, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, Mother Woman and uh, the programming that Mother Woman has been doing to include community in um, identifying the concerns of community and involving community in, um, and actually coming up with solutions or addressing those kinds of concerns. Um, just a little bit about Mother Woman. It started in 1999 by um, a few women in the um, Hampshire County area of the, of the state, of some of you might know where that's like Hadley area, Amherst, Northampton. Um, <clears throat> and it was to address the lack of resources for postpartum moms, particularly as it relates to um, mental health issues. Um, both um, could be PPD, anxiety, could be just baby blues, or even just um, social isolation. And um, they came up with a model for um, creating a peer support group um, and trained lots of people <laughs> on this method. Um, and so then in 2004, it became a 501c3. And then, um, you know, it's just much like any nonprofit, they had their ups and downs. And in 2016, um, there were some major changes to the organization. I was asked to come on to the board um, in December of 2016. And um, it then the organization moved from Hadley, Massachusetts to Holyoke, which uh, is somewhere in between the urbanness um, of Springfield and sort of the ruralness of, of um, Hampshire County. And then um, in the midst of me starting out as part of the board, I started asking questions. Um, I think the researchness of me came out, and I. And I asked, you know, like, where, what is the data? Like, where's the data? Um, 
What research have you done? How is this getting to vulnerable populations? Who are you training? Is this accessible? Um, who's sitting on the board? Who, you know, and, and then next thing I know, I blinked and I became the president. They voted me president. And um, like I had time to do this. But, but anyway, that's what essentially happened. Um, and so I um, asked a few of the people that were, that remained on the board to um, come along with me on a journey to sort of rethink how we are approaching um, th these services that we are providing to moms or potential moms. Um, and so what I'm going to present to you is sort of a combination of using what was already there and then where we're hoping to take the organization. So um, these are sort of the three tiers of things that we sort of visualize. Oh, I forgot to tell you. Let me tell you the mission. The mission, we, and we're, it's still a work in progress. We have changed the mission and probably will change it again. Um, and, but right now it is to promote the resilience and empowerment of mothers and their communities by building community capacity and advocating for just policies through evidence-based research and grassroots organizing. And um, so this slide shows you the three tiers of what we are, we are attempting to do. Um, the first being community capacity, building the capacity to actually address the needs of moms and um, doing some research, which I will explain a little bit about our project called Mama's Voice. And then um, Mother Woman has historically been involved in some advocacy projects, including the very last one, um, the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, which actually was um, started um, through um, conversations from Mother Woman um, by a woman named um, Laura Sylvester. And we successfully got this passed. I hope you all have heard about it. Your employer should have told you. Um, so starting at the bottom in the community, community capacity is the facilitator training, which is what I had mentioned before. And this is um, training anyone who is interested in running a support group. And we have a model for that. <clears throat> and it can be for, um, it was started primarily for uh, PPD, but has been expanded to a wide variety of areas, teen moms, um, um, women in recovery, um, women in prison, I mean, just, you know, whatever, the needs, um, bereavement, special needs, those kinds of things. Um, and then if you move up, one of the things that we noticed in, in doing some of our work was that many of the providers that are, um, there's not a lot of providers who are doing um, evidence-based therapy to address PPD or, or post um, part of mood disorders. And so cognitive behavior therapy is one of them. So we started offering that training. And then we also recognized that at least in the Western part of the state, that a lot of the providers did not look like um, the people who needed the, the assistance. So we started to um, really think about ways in which we can recruit um, um, providers of color, um, LGBTQ, et cetera, et cetera, to um, provide services. And then um, sort of, I wasn't going to talk about this before, but based on some of the conversations earlier, I thought um, including a, a rich conversation about cultural humility, um, some of you may or may not have heard about cultural humility. It is um, a, a philosophy in which, um, or a philosophy or slash a tool to um, look at the relationships and your interactions between providers or um, um, service organizations and patients and um, their clients. Um, and it comes out of uh, work out of um, Children's Hospital of Oakland, um, two, two pediatricians out of there, uh, Dr. Melanie Turvalon and Jan Murray Garcia. So if anybody's interested, um, I can give you a little bit more information about that. But one of the things that we had decided is that we were going to focus on um, vulnerable populations and disenfranchised populations. And so cultural humility has really taken on a huge role in our, um, our work. And we are committed to being um, a culturally humble organization, or at least be on that journey. And so we also provide trainings in that. And then um, the CPPSM is the model that we're using to um, to bring together groups of people um, to work on perinatal um, issues and support. And so I'll talk about that. And then our evidence-based project is um, Mama's Voice. So this is the original CPSM. Um, and 
there's 12 coalitions across the state. Some of are operating really well. Franklin County has a very successful coalition. Um, they have actually leveraged their position to um, receive a million dollar grant to do some work in um, the prisons. And then there are some um, coalitions that are not doing quite as well, but we're hoping to um, receive some funds to help those coalitions. But this was the idea, um, that's the model and it's sort of cir um, circular so that you bring leaders together, you tr do some training, you provide technical support, but the whole idea is to get moms um, screened for PPD and then end to treatment. And um, we had decided to change the model a little bit and add a couple of components. And so these are the three. The first one is making it more community-based. And so when I came up, came on and I started looking at the coalitions, I recognized that it was um, provider heavy. So um, whether it was OBs, whether it was uh, midwives, doulas, service providers, unless people who had a different kind of vested interest in that you know, in the issue. And so we are reaching out to the coalitions to say, hey, you need to really think about how you can bring moms on this onto your coalition so that you can stop providing solutions to um, and asking people what they actually need and, you know, coming up with solutions um, with. And then I mentioned the cultural humility. Again, um, we are providing training so that um, Anybody who's sitting on these coalitions actually know how to interact or use this as a tool to interact with the people that they're providing services to. And then the last one I'd already mentioned is that um, we have noticed that we have um, a, we lack the professionals to um, address the issues. Okay. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to talk quickly about is um, the research project that we're working on called Mama's Voice. And um, voice is um, voicing our individual cultural experiences. And this is actually a photo voice project. Um, I heard Dr. Goodja Clark make the comment about not using qualitative, which I thought was kind of funny because this is a qualitative. Um, but it is a photo voice project that we have been, um, this is about a year and a half that we have been working on um, where we're asking moms in um, the Holyoke area and the Springfield area to provide photos of what it means to be a mom of color in, in those spaces. Um, and I presented at APHA uh, the results of our second round um, last November. And so if anybody wants to hear any more about that, I would, I would love to talk to you about it. Um, but it is very interesting to see the ways in which um, people experience the the regular stressors, but then there are some that are very culturally based um, that are often not addressed. Um, and I think this is one way to sort of identify that. The other thing is we, we thought about looking at um, how can we redefine what it means to have mental, quote, mental health issues as a mom of color? Um, maybe it's not PPD or anxiety, but maybe it's high levels of stress that, and I think you all know this, but that affect not just our mental health, but our physical health as well. But how is that captured on a screening tool that's only looking for depression or anxiety or OCD? And so this tool, we're hoping, I mean, not this tool, I'm sorry, this process we're hoping to be able to redefine what it means to have um, some issues that need to be addressed. And that's it. Thank you. So, um, sort of circling back um, to uh, one of our organizations here in Massachusetts, um, we're going to be hearing from Karen Downs, who is the uh, Maternal and Child Health Director uh, for the Title V programs in Massachusetts and the Director of Pregnancy, Infancy, and Early Childhood within the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Um, sort of in, uh, including and outside of that spectrum, she's been doing work uh, here and internationally for over 40 years. Um, focusing on providing support to women and their families to ensure optimal health and economic outcomes um, and attempting to address the social factors that contribute to mat maternal mortality and morbidity um, and, and the inequity. Um, she's very interested in strengthening a system of care um, that addresses the social and racial uh, justice that um, 
would sort of, that dismantles the structural systems um, that have led to our current situation and trying to ensure that women and their families, again, families are very important, receive all the support that they need. Antepartum, peripartum, and postpartum. So, good afternoon. Um, I am in, I'm in a great uh, position of following on a lot of people who have really laid the groundwork for some of the things that I'm going to say. Um, I wanted to um, say that although I work at the state level, what, we, what I really feel that I'm doing is trying to bridge the, the, the community, the, the, um, the chasm between the community voice and policy and the state level. So although we work at the state state level, um, much of what we do really has to be and must be grounded in the voices of the, of the community. And I think we've heard of that from many people, starting with Gene DeClerc and his Listen to Women, which was um, number three of his. Um, and also Dr. Molina really uh, spoke to the need in a clinical practice to be very mindful of how we speak with people. And um, you know, looking at implicit bias, I want to add to that implicit bias piece, really understanding power dynamics within a room. That is critically important. And I'll talk to that a bit more later. And um, I will, with that, I'm going to figure out how to press forward. Um, enter. There we go. Got it. Um, so I'm going to talk about three community strategies that we use at the Department of Public Health to really listen to community voices. The first is we have um, some federal funding and a little bit of state funding to provide home visiting uh, services to uh, pregnant and parenting families. The first is funded through the federal McV, which is Maternal Infant Early Childhood Home Visiting Program. And we've used some funding from McVie to also uh, implement a, a program called Welcome Family, which is a one-time postpartum universally offered home visit in, in certain communities. And the third one is a state, what we call, the feds have this, the federal government has this, you know, they have evidence-based and then they have this affectionate turn of home, homegrown uh, program. So the EIPP is our homegrown Massachusetts version. The, uh, the other piece I want to talk to a little bit more is uh, community network mapping. I mean, how do, we, how do we look at the system of care from the community level? And we have a very uh, structured approach that we're hoping to use across multiple programs. And then um, the Title V needs assessment. That is, and I'll get a little bit more into that later, but Title V is Title V of the Social Security Act that provides funding to all states to support um, families and children, including those with special health needs. So home visiting. Um, I think the, the goal for home visiting is really to be that link, that liaison between the medical system or the system of services and with families. Home visitors in most programs are, they're either community health workers, um, one of the models, EIPP, which I had mentioned, there's a nurse and there's a social worker or a clinical specialist that may be a mental health specialist. And then um, in some, they're, they're, they're peer moms in recovery, for example, in some of the home visiting programs that are more specific to uh, families affected by substance use. So um, we, in what, what happens in the home visiting, I think that the, the point is to really meet families where they are, to really hear and understand what their challenges and issues are, and to really promote um, a, a different paradigm, you know, rather than them being those people or low income or, or people who need help, really support them starting from where they are, listening to their stories, and really looking at reframing and taking a, more of a strength-based approach. You know, what have they done well in the past? How can they be positive parents? Um, what, what do they need? You know, what is their understanding of how the system has treated them? And how can they really sort of walk along the sides, similar to uh, what Neko was talking about in terms of a doula? That is the role that a lot of the home visitors play. And you know, when we 
when we were looking, thinking of the home visiting, and I also wanted to uh, circle back to one of the questions, a huge part of the home visiting program is really speaking with families after they've delivered about their intentions for having another child or not. Um, and even, you know, two or three years out, the question is always, um, do you have the intention of being pregnant and then support them in whatever their decision is? And that, so that, that, that is one thing that's a critical part of our home visiting program. So, but this is not usually where we talk about, this is the immediate postpartum. These visits take place um, between four and eight weeks postpartum. And um, we, we only have enough money at this point <laughs> to universally offer, offer, offer this in five communities. We're hoping to figure out a mechanism to sustain this because we've had a lot of, of really positive feedback. Um, so what, what people have felt is that this is a point of intersection between giving birth and the rest of their lives. And, you know, when they're, when they're pregnant, a lot of focus is on the pregnancy and then, you know, the baby, and then the baby's born, and then suddenly the woman sort of drops out of view. So we really wanted a program that focused and supported the woman and tried to figure out what she wanted and how to support her in parenting. So um, you, can, you can go look at some of the research. And we were identified as a promising <laughs> approach, and we have developed a we have written a couple of articles. And at this point, um, I really think there's a lot of value in thinking about this as a, a potential policy uh, initiative across, across the state. Um, Oregon has just passed legislation that provides a um, universally offered one to three visits postpartum, and that's part of their early childhood um, bundle if you will, in, in Oregon. So we're hoping to learn from them. As I said, I can't start in the community without thinking systems wide as well. So, um, so how, what do we do at the, at the, community live, uh, the community level more specifically? One thing we realized um, when we often went out to the communities and talked to them was that we were, we were encouraging families to participate on um, community coalitions or, you know, to join advisory groups. Um, but what that didn't recognize, I want to circle back to the idea of the power dynamic. What we found often was that we had tokenism on these advisory committees and on these coalitions. And we really wanted to be a little more strategic about what, how we, how we formed a coalition and so what we are doing in, in one community and hoping to replicate it in other communities is that we really start first with families with lived experience um, in, in a network mapping exercise that from their perspective um, asks them how they, what about their journey through the system of health, or the healthcare system? What worked, what didn't work? What, what was helpful, what wasn't helpful? This particular network mapping we are, um, we are doing with uh, families in recovery or with substance use disorders, specifically opioid use disorders, but, we, but it could be applied for any experience. And once they have done their network mapping and we have looked at you know, what are the, what are the, the challenges, um, then we sort of encapsulate all of that and um, ask which of them would like to be community leaders and speaking out on what their experience was. And soon after that, we do a provider and community net leader network mapping, which is interesting because usually it looks totally different from the family network net mapping. And so the families will have their perception of the systems. Then we'll get the providers, and, and the more diverse the providers and the community leaders, the more rich the, the network mapping is. And then uh, they will come up with their solutions or their ideas or, or their trigger points, that things that aren't working. Then we bring everyone together. And that's the point at which um, the real uh, dialogue and coalition building happens. You know, at that point, um, we ask people to talk about shared vision, you know, who's good, going to be the backbone organizations from both perspectives, what would be the indicators of success and how can they align their activities. And um, one of the most critical pieces is having a communication structure. And then after that has um, coalesced and there's a coalition that has come up with a strategic plan, then we have learning collaboratives across the state so communities can really learn from each other. And 
I thought I'd have all the time in the world, and now I'm really <laughs> having to go quickly. Um, the Title V needs assessment. I'm not going to go too much into uh, discussion about what Title V is. Just to say that there is a, a very strong um, quantitative part, which Fifi, uh, my colleague, leads. And then there's a, there's a strong qualitative part. You know, before I was in public health and before I was a nurse, I actually was an anthropologist. So this is back to my roots. And what we do in our needs assessment, every five years we're required as a part of the funding to conduct a comprehensive state needs assessment that then uh, dictates what our state priorities are for the next five years. So that's a huge task and we want to get it right. And we want to, we want to look at the data and look at trends and you know, we interpret what might be happening, but what we really want um, is the voice of communities. And so, we, we um, have a whole series of focus groups. Some of the ones that we had the last time around, we're just gearing up for our, our 2020 near needs assessment now, but in 2015, we spoke with um, moms who had given birth, uh, uh, moms of color, Hispanic groups. We had a great LGBTQ uh, group, um, and in these groups is really fun. Um, nobody has to use their real name, and, the, and everything is de-identified. So the LGBTQ came up with the great, you know, we had Mickey Mouse, and we had all kinds of people on that team. Um, incarcerated parents, their perspective is invaluable. If you talk about people who are most oppressed and most disenfranchised and most disconnected from their families, um, I would say it's, it's the incarcerated parents. And teen parents. So in addition to the focus, group, focus groups, um, we, we do surveys and we, we use all of this information, we collate it to determine our state priorities. And the one thing I want to say that happened, you know, I'm not going to go into what our, our state priorities are. You, know, you can look them up, Title V information system, look up Massachusetts and you'll see all our priorities. But one thing that really came out strong and clear from the series of focus groups from every single focus group was, um, was the need to address racism. And, you know, I had teenagers stand up to say in focus groups, I am not standing for the Pledge of Allegiance until there's liberty and justice for all, and I'm not seeing that. And, you know, it just gave me, it just gave me, you know, chills, chills just to hear how this was a consistent theme. And because of that, one of the priorities that we set in our state was to really um, address health inequities by addressing social justice, uh, racial justice specifically and leading with race in everything that we do in terms of even looking at the data, looking at what our policies are internally, and looking at how we can um, really frame um, the principles for the contracted vendors in our states. And I think, okay, this is one of the groups. This is an actual real picture. Um, <coughs> And that's how you can get in touch with me.